Well, as I listened to that, basically what that made me feel like was old. Uh, most of those things were occurring before most of you were probably born. Uh, I would like to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, the Masonic um, villages uh, today, uh, but I also want to uh, specifically uh, be talking about um, Elizabethtown College, you as students, uh, what I see, um, some of the things that are happening in the economy. Uh, I'd like to also tell you as I go through some personal experiences that I think have changed me from the perspective of being a leader uh, in an organization. And I think I have to start. Uh, I was about your age when I first came to uh, the Masonic Homes at that time, Masonic Village today. One of the things that uh, I was recruited. Now, hopefully all of you are going to get multiple recruitment calls as you're finishing your education here. I was recruited. I had a telephone call uh, to take a position at the Masonic Homes at the time. Uh, this person called and I was working my way through college and had finished two years and I was looking for a position. So the person called and said, Joey, you need to apply for this job. Now, that probably sounds a little funny as being from a recruiter, except it was my grandmother. <laughs> and she, uh, I'm going to give her a lot of credit for starting me on a career that I never expected. Because what I was looking to do was I was planning on being a CPA. That was my plan. I had it well documented in my head. I knew how I was going to get to that point. And uh, coming there in the accounting finance department of our organization, I was going to be finishing my degree at the same time getting experience. And as soon as I finished that, my plan was that I would be going to a public accounting firm so I could finish my time that I needed to do there to be certified. That was where I started. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story about our village and I'll try to fill in some of the things that changed my opinion as to what I wanted to do. And partly I'm telling you this story because you, I'm sure there's a few of you, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, already have set exactly what you're planning on doing when you graduate. I'm sure there has to be a, some of you. I think that probably as you go forward, and you might have already heard this from some of your professors and others, you're probably going to have a chance to be in five to 10 different professions, not jobs, but professions possibly until you finish your working career. That's the type of thing that I think we're, we're seeing that's going to be happening, and I think that you're going to get to experience firsthand. One of the pieces that I'd like to do a little bit is talk about, well, what is the Masonic Village? And uh, up on this, um, on the chart today, uh, shows a screen that indicates that nonprofit retirement communities across the nation were the 22nd largest community uh, in the nation. Uh, with all of our campuses that we wind up having. Right now, uh, across Pennsylvania, uh, we're located in uh, five different locations. Uh, when I first came here, we were at one, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, as you're looking at the drawing or at the map, it's on the far left-hand side. The Masonic Village at Swickley, that's located in Allegheny County, uh, was a piece that uh, I will talk some about when that happened and why in a little bit. Uh, then at the top on the uh, right-hand side, uh, the Masonic Village at Dallas in Luzerne County, uh, Masonic Village at Warminster in Bucks, uh, Masonic Village in Lafayette Hill in Montgomery County, and the Masonic Village in Elizabethtown, which was, is within uh, a mile of here. And I have to tell you, I get a chance to speak quite a bit, uh, travel to various places to do this. It was wonderful to have to go a whole mile and uh, deal with one red light. Uh, to get here. So it was a positive for me to be able to be here with you today for more than just the pleasure of your company. I think uh, one of the other pieces, uh, the Masonic uh, Village at Elizabethtown, our campus, we're located on 1,430 acres. Uh, it's a large campus, just from a land mass perspective, but we're also, that site is the 10th largest CCRC or retirement community in the nation. So it is large by virtue of comparison with other organizations. When I first started with the organization, uh, we were one site. Uh, this site was picked in 1910. It was a location. And no, if you're wondering, I was not part of the organization at that time. 
and not in a leadership role. But I would tell you that uh, at that time, they looked across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and said, where is the right place for us to be? And they looked at 33 sites across, across the Commonwealth. And this site was selected. Now, go back historically. 1909 was when they were doing some of this, this final process. Communication or transportation was a big issue. Well, at that time, railroad was a major transportation piece. Uh, some of you possibly still use the railroad coming and going here to the college uh, with the new upgraded uh, train stations occurring. That was one of the critical components back at that time as to why this was selected. Also that it was somewhat central in uh, the Commonwealth in being able to provide services. So at that time, it was founded as a mission organization. Uh, we were looking at, not we literally that I was there, but they were looking at that time at how do you go and provide services to individuals who cannot afford to pay. The county homes or the poor homes that were known at that time were despicable. They were really terrible and organizations were looking, a lot of faith-based organizations were looking at how to go and provide that in a better way. Uh, as we went to do that, um, this site was created. They were looking for a, a fair amount of land. Uh, the farm that was here uh, was an important aspect and all of the food that was consumed for probably the first 40 or 45 years was actually raised on the grounds. So it was a complete circle cycle um, for, uh, for us at that point. So this site was located, or uh, was uh, selected, and uh, from 1910 until uh, the late, uh, in about 1998, so for over 80 some years, that was the location we provided services from. Then at that point, we were, we were contacted by another organization that had communities in Allegheny County, in Bellevue, Allegheny County, and also in Warminster Bucks County. They were having problems from an occupancy perspective. They were small and they were looking to see whether or not we would be willing to merge with them and possibly join in providing mission services. That was decided for us to do that. And uh, one of those sites in our Warminster is still uh, part of our community. One of the things that I'll you'll hear from me quite a bit is everything we plan probably 50% of it gets changed. Not because we want to necessarily change it, but because we wind up having to be in an environment that's changing rapidly. Healthcare and services are changing dra dramatically at this time, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we're going through. One of the things that we found out, because we were serving individuals who could not afford to pay, that's a strength of ours in providing that charitable mission, that the state of Pennsylvania decided they would not Medicaid certify the community that was in Allegheny County. Based upon that, we made a decision. We would look for a nursing center at, in that area and try to purchase it. We wound up looking at 15 locations and wound up ultimately securing a nursing home that was a not-for-profit, community-based uh, community, and their board's mission was very similar to ours and we decided that they would uh, agree to us acquiring that site that included 47 acres. Our goal was to build a complete retirement community at that location. As we started that, uh, we built a brand new uh, personal care area and started to build retirement living apartments. Today, we have 271 apartments and villas at that location, uh, 64 individuals served in personal care, and we just finished uh, three months ago, a brand new 128 bed nursing center uh, at that location. As we started to do that, uh, when we finished our personal care, we moved all of our residents that were originally part of the Bellevue community that had merged with us, all of our residents and our employees, they came with us. You're going to hear a common theme uh, of, through this process about taking care of the individuals we serve, but also the people who do the serving. We think that's an important aspect of everything we do from an operational uh, side. As that was growing and we were uh, filling up, um, getting ready for retirement living, we had another community in Montgomery County uh, that contacted us in 2003 to see about merging with us. They uh, approached us again. They were having operational challenges. They had been in that site since the 70s and we were looking, they were looking to see whether they could become part of our organization. 
we did analysis on a couple different, a couple different ways. Number one, uh, was that an area that we had a need from a, service from a service perspective? And did it also help serve our mission? Uh, after analyzing that, it did. So in 2004, they joined us creating uh, our fourth uh, community at that time. A year later, we had a community in Luzerne County, uh, and it actually, it's an it's a, a organization that has 360 acres. It's a golf course country club. And they approached us and said, um, would you like to build a Masonic village on our country club? And I have to tell you that that was not what we were looking for specifically uh, from a service component. But after we analyzed it, we recognized that it was a beautiful location, great 18 hold. I'm not a golfer, Tillingham uh, course, and a lot of folks thought it was a great area. As we started to look from a mission perspective and operations, did it make sense for us? After that analysis, we decided that it did. One of the things that we also went to, and when we do a retirement community, it typically will have a continuum, meaning that it'll have nursing services, personal care, and independent living or retirement living. When we went into this community, we found out there were a lot of faith-based nonprofit organizations already providing those services, and they had occupancy challenges, meaning that they had plenty of capacity to serve people. So rather than us building something that was not needed in those communities, we went to evangelical uh, services and uh, uh, the Sisters of Mercy and talked with them about partnering with us. This was one of the first times we looked and said, we can do something together with other people and have a mission that is stronger. After those conversations, we now have a retirement community at that location, and the, the fulfillment of those other services are actually provided through relationships with two other faith-based organizations, which um, it creates a tremendous positive for us. As we started to build that, uh, we actually wound up uh, being approached as to would you be interested in operating the clubhouse? Now, hopefully by now you're starting to pick up. We've not, been, we've not gone out to ask anybody to do any of these things so far. Uh, we've never run, we've never at that point run a country club clubhouse. However, we do, we do a lot of food services. And after we started doing the analysis, we found that a lot of that was similar. So uh, after a year uh, conversation, uh, we actually built a new clubhouse that serves our residents, but it also serves uh, the uh, golf course uh, for the individuals who are participating, this, uh, <coughs> participating in that. I'm sharing with you that that is a process that as op opportunities come to us, we analyze those and move forward. I'm gonna suggest that each of you are going to see that happening so much in your life that there are going to be things that are going to come to you that not necessarily are what you were planning. Now, we're a nonprofit organization, but one of the things that we, as we've grown with this, we have a very strong core mission, and I'm gonna talk about that, but as we've grown, we've needed to go out and borrow funds. Uh, sometimes that was the absolute best thing for us to do. Standard & Poor's is an organization that rates organizations uh, nationally, internationally, uh, we, uh, we have been uh, rated by Standard & Poor's for multiple years. Uh, we are an A-rated uh, entity uh, by Standard & Poor's. Uh, we're one of less than a dozen uh, organizations, uh, post-acute providers of care, that have an A rating um, a, uh, across the country. One of the pieces that I, I share with you, uh, in their commentary, they, they, they comment about the fact that we're in an industry or in a business that has a strong demand. Um, people are, are aging and eventually they potentially would be looking for services. Very positive. They also commented about uh, us having a strong balance sheet. Uh, we've been very conservative over our years and I'll talk a little bit about that coming up. Uh, but then they go and as they're saying those positive things about us in the evaluation, then they go and they say, however, they continue to have an operating loss and that management continues to share, that's because of their mission. I will tell you that uh, annually I get to do my song and dance for Standard & Poor along with our chief financial officer. And it is telling our story. But I have to tell you, a lot of times as I'm listening to the dialogue, they keep coming back with the same question. Well, this is wonderful, 
but you have such a positive product, why don't you just take care of people who can pay? Now, I have to tell you, it's difficult to go and explain to Standard & Poor's. And if, if any of you have relatives that are in there and do ratings, I didn't say that. But that is a challenge because they are looking for solid financial statements and the mission piece is really not a criteria that they're looking at. However, in our organization, as you're going to hear from me as I go along in my, my presentation today, that's a core value for us. That's one of the pieces that uh, we're not going to change. Um, that if I went back to my board and said, I've got a great idea how we can go and get to be an A-plus or a double-A rated uh, organization, all we're going to do is stop taking care of people who can't afford to pay, I probably would be unemployed because they would understand I, I forgot the mission of our organization. So what is it that we wind up doing? Uh, from a business perspective, um, we do retirement living at four of our five locations. We do personal care at four of our five locations. Uh, nursing care, the same. Our children's home, we have a children's home here in Elizabethtown. And some of you possibly, especially I think it's the freshmen, might have an opportunity to do something uh, with us uh, with some great programming that was done last year uh, and involved our children's home. And I'd highly advocate if, if you get that opportunity to encourage you to do so. Uh, the children's home is a piece where we have 40 children uh, who are with us, um, part of our strong part of our mission, and have been there uh, for 100 years we've been providing those services. We also have a group home for adults with mild to moderate mental retardation um, that is part of our community. We do adult daily living. A lot of people need to be someplace during the day, then they can be home with their families. Uh, that's a part of our continuum because we know we can care for some folks in that area. We also have home care where we recognize they want to stay in their home and they just need some help. So we also go out and assist people from that perspective. End of life is a, is a normal process, we believe, and we've had a very strong hospice program uh, from our organization that reaches out in about a 20 mile radius around this, uh, this specific location. Outreach is a program we offer services to people, education services to people literally uh, all over the United States. At two of our locations, we have child daycare centers where we have children six weeks of age uh, up through kindergarten. We're also at three of our campuses, we are big into wellness programming. Um, and that is a, is a portion that's available and in our Elizabethtown campus also available for the community. A year and a half ago, uh, we were focused inward on how do we improve our organization. And as we did that, we brought on an individual who was going to be our chief mission development officer. Her name is Jennifer Schwamm. She was a partner, she's a CPA, a partner with Parente. And she had done various uh, facility assessment reviews of our organization over the last 15 years. Things were changing so rapidly, we recognized we were going to have to be more attentive to that. We needed to be doing that every day, all the time, at every one of our locations. So she came and she joined us and we started that process. One of the reasons we did that was that we had just gotten word that the state budget had been changed starting July 1st of that year and the residents that we were serving up to June 30 in the previous fiscal year, we were going to be paid $6 million less than we were the year before. Now, my conversation with the board was, did you know that state budget change is going to affect us in our reimbursement by $6 million? And as I looked at them, they, they smiled and they said, that's an opportunity. That might even be a challenge. And I was thinking in my head, I think that's one of those big C challenges. Um, they then went on to share. Um, we recognize that the team's going to have to work hard, but we're not planning on changing our mission. When that was occurring across the Commonwealth, a lot of organizations, our peer organizations, were simply saying, we will just have to take less people who cannot afford to pay. That was, the, that was the basic method that people were using as a, as a solution uh, with that. So we went and <clears throat> brought Jennifer on to help us. Within, uh, within a three month period of time after she joined us, we had teams at every one of our locations, our five locations across the Commonwealth, they had already come up with over $3 million of revenue enhancements or expense reductions without us decreasing any services or anybody being laid off. 
key components that you're going to hear some more about. So when she joined us in that first three months, we were focused inward, and then somebody came from another organization and said, we need help. We've got a building that's not occupied. We need some, we need some management support. Would you be willing to do that? That was in March. By May, we had started Ashler Creative Solutions. It's a separate entity. Um, it's a consulting company. And it's made up of our corporate team. We didn't add one person to our staff. We wound up um, analyzing this for a, a facility in New Jersey. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And uh, we wound up uh, starting a consulting business because it was something that presented itself that we were going to be able to help somebody else with their mission at the same time the revenue generated would go directly to underwriting some of that $6 million that wound up being, being decreased. Also uh, on there is uh, Acacia Services, the country club. Uh, you already, uh, I already shared with you. Uh, we created that specifically so that we could focus on that for our Dallas facility. Also a service component that's on here is fundraising. Um, when you look down at the bottom of this, you'll see that in 2013, we provided $31 million worth of charitable care and services. Now for some of you, that might not be a lot. I don't have that many zeros in my checkbook. I have to tell you that that is a lot of money to be making available every year so that we can continue our mission. So when we're doing that, fundraising becomes a key component for us. In the last 10 years, we've done three capital campaigns. The first capital campaign was for five years for $50 million. We, at the end of our five years, met our $50 million raised. We then immediately went into a three-year campaign to try to raise $25 million. And at the end of the three years, we had hit $29 million. We just finished a two-year campaign for $10 million for our children's home, and we raised $10,144,000. I'm mentioning this to you because just like everything else we do, we pay attention to this because it's important to our mission. Without this, we wouldn't be able to provide the care and services that we do as part of our mission. I'd like to just talk to you from a, a perspective of, if I'm looking at business, what are some of the key things over my career that I think are important? And I did this on a for-profit, not-for-profit basis. And, and I'm saying that because you're going to hear me that I think no matter where you decide to go, I think these are prime pieces that are important. The number one item that I have on here is ethics. You possibly have heard about business leaders and others that possibly have not had the appropriate ethics. Um, I've seen and I've worked with people in the for-profit as well as the non-for-profit area that have had extremely high ethics and they're the people that I want to do business with. They're the people that you can trust, that you know that what they tell you is what you're going to receive. I also would advocate for you as you're getting ready to make some of your first selections as to where you're going to work, not only when they give you that great offer, which I know you're all going to get, but I'd also have you take a look at the ethics of the organization. Is it something that meets your background and what you're comfortable with? Because I do believe that it's extremely difficult to do a great job for an organization if you don't believe in that. Entrepreneurship. Uh, Obviously, you'll see uh, in the for-profit world, the people that you read about in the Wall Street Journal and in various other uh, business sites, they're the folks that come up with this great new idea. They're out there at markets. They wind up being million billionaires immediately. I have to tell you, that same desire, that same spark comes over the nonprofit. You're just not going to become a million billion a billionaire. But I have to tell you, to be successful, we need to have people in our organization that are constantly focused on how can we do it better. I already talked about those mission reviews that Jennifer came in. We literally have hundreds and hundreds of people who are looking at things. How can we do it better? How can we possibly enhance our mission? Another great thing. And then the bottom line. I, I shared with you, I originally started as an accountant in our organization, and I understand the importance of having a positive bottom line. Uh, in business, uh, very positive. Uh, that positive bottom line goes to the owners, stockholders, et cetera. The only thing that's different in a nonprofit, it goes to mission. That's how you wind up being in a position to do $31 million worth of charitable care and services. 
If you're not focused on doing things appropriately from a business perspective, you're not able to have as strong a mission as you possibly would like. The other piece, and this is a portion I think it's important as you leave here, because I'm really impressed with Elizabethtown College. Uh, I like educate to serve. I like that a lot. I think that no matter what you wind up doing as you go from here, you're going to be in a position to be able to make an impact in your community. It might be from a business perspective, it might be in a volunteer perspective, it doesn't matter if you're in a for-profit or in a non-for-profit. I think that that's a, a tremendous opportunity for each of you to make a significant difference um, going forward. Now let me give you a, a war story. Um, I remember that uh, we were, uh, as a team, looking at our budget for 2009. I know most of you were like 12 or 13 at that time, um, but just humor me as we come through this piece. To, this, was what, this was a piece that wound up, uh, we were hearing some things that were occurring. Number one, a lot of the people we were working with, um, they, were, they were talking about their business activity. S contracts were down, things weren't happening. All of a sudden, they were starting to see this change that was significant. We also saw the stock market starting to drop. In that same time period, because of people worrying about this, people weren't as willing to buy a new home. We also, and I categorize this as banking judgment errors. I could be a lot harsher than that, but I'm gonna use banking judgment errors that occurred. Sometimes it was mortgages that shouldn't have been given, and there's a whole variety of other things that occurred. These things wound up leading into something that was major. And I, I'm sharing this, this, is, this goes both national, international, but also I'm gonna bring it back personal for the village as to what to just do. So on this, on this slide that you're seeing, uh, you're looking at the Dow Jones, and that is the one that's in the, um, the little square that's on there, and the um, diamond is the, the Masonic Village, uh, our consolidated fund. So what does this wind up showing me uh, that, we're, that we're winding up having? And if I'm looking at this on here, we wound up in October of, um, of 2007 with the, uh, the Dow Jones being somewhere at about 14,000. And at that time, our investments were about $610 million. All of a sudden, we went to 2009, and the Dow Jones went to somewhere about 7,000. And we went from 610 million to 390 million, a drop of market value of 220 million dollars. Now, that might again not affect you personally, but I will tell you that that was a major piece for us in looking at it as an organization. I already talked about the charity, so if you're taking 20, 200 million dollars off of the table to generate money, that winds up at a 5% return, about $10 million a year. As this was going forward, we went to our board and we said, we think we have to go and do some major changes. Here are 44 ideas that we've come up with on how we're going to survive getting through this time period. This was one of those times when you think that um, you're, you're gonna remember a long time. I remember uh, expecting the board to challenge us on some of the 44 giving us other ideas, but instead, the board told me two things. They said, we recognize that you're gonna be faced with a lot of issues coming up over the next couple of years. These are the two things that you and the team need to stay in place, keep in mind constantly. Number one, we're not gonna change our mission. Have you heard that once or twice today from me? We're not gonna change our mission. Now, I'm sitting there, and I have to tell you, market values are changing significantly, and we're not gonna change our mission. The second thing they said, and this was the piece that clinched this, this was probably the best decision they ever made. We're not going to lay off one staff person. Now, I will tell you, at that time, every organization, they were doing massive cuts. That was the first thing that was occurring. So our Chief Human Resources Officer and I went out to every one of our locations, talked with all of our staff on every one of the shifts. We explained to them what was happening. Now, most of them expected we were coming out to announce major layoffs. When we shared with them that we were promising them no one was going to be laid off, but we needed their help. We needed to come up with $10 million 
worth of improvements, revenue, or expense reductions to be able to keep our mission going as strong as it was. We also shared this message with our residents who are part of our communities. Within two weeks, I wound up with over 300 emails and letters from people on our team suggesting various methods that we possibly could be moving forward with. So in that time period, we wound up with all of these ideas. And I have to tell you that part of this is, now some of those ideas might have been how we save $50. Some of those ideas were things like people saying in a snowstorm, I'm going home now, I'll come back later when you need me, that way you won't have to pay me time and half. And these are people who can use the extra money, but they bought into the mission. So why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you now that if you can build a team that trusts you because of your ethics, if you also trust them to understand that they are worth being listened to on a constant basis, you can do amazing things. So, how did it wind up going through? We wound up capturing all $10 million and we did not have to change one piece of our mission. We didn't stop taking people day one that required medical assistance. We still were taking individuals who were charity care the first day coming in uh, to our organization. During that time period, if a position opened, we didn't always fill it immediately. And that's where the team came in because they came up with methods for us to do workarounds that enabled us until we could get through this major challenge that was happening internationally that we were in a position to continue this strong mission. So, as they say, and then there's the rest of the story. So we wound up, um, we made it through that, that valley and uh, over the next two years, um, we didn't spend extra money out of our investments. Rather than just taking that out and spending it down, we didn't, we left it there, even in its depressed uh, lower rate, but it started to regain. As that was occurring, uh, the team continued to monitor what we were doing, and we started putting in place, we started putting in place plans for once the recovery occurs, what are we going to be doing? Our capital budget typically has about 15 to 20 million dollars in normal capital upgrades that we do across our five campuses. Remember, Elizabethtown campus is over 100 years old. To keep it looking brand new, we need to continue to maintain that. We went down to spending for two years $1 million or less. So a lot of things were deferred. What winds up showing here, uh, you'll see that uh, we've actually come up today to about $670 million. Uh, the Dow Jones is higher than us now, and the reason is, over the last three years, we've spent over $100 million reinvesting back in our plant and our materials. So the pieces that we left go, we've now brought them back, and we're at a position as strong as we were before, but we've also caught up with those, with those items. <clears throat> so mission development goals. Um, that, was a, that was a bad story from a bad time, but we're seeing this on an everyday basis. Uh, short term, uh, we constantly are working to resolve budgetary shortfalls. I'd love to go to Standard & Poor's and say, our mission's the same, but somehow we were able to figure out a way to come to a positive bottom line. We're working on that, not there yet, that's continuing. We also recognize that in our delivery services, it's constantly changing. Healthcare is, if you're going into the healthcare field and you don't like change, think about a different job. Because it's constantly going to be changing as we're moving, for, uh, moving forward. We also are looking to do a lot from supporting and expanding our mission. And I'm gonna talk about that. In some cases, uh, economics, uh, economies of scale, will enable us to do more things than we were able to do before. One of the things that, uh, there was an anonymous quote, uh, life gives us opportunities for growth disguised as challenging circumstances. I, I think as I re reflected back on some of the 2008 and 9, that wound up being the case. So what are some of the challenges that we're seeing in 2014? Well, there's a few. Uh, we recognize reimbursements, uncertainty, technology. Right now we are changing every software system we have in our organization in a year and a half's time period. 
Uh, we're spending multiple million dollars. We're doing that because we recognize going forward that's going to be the key for efficiency in services that we provide. Uh, strategic opportunities, we're looking for those constantly. Uh, we also have an aging uh, group. Um, I'm 59. Um, eventually, I plan on retiring. Every one of our, every time we do a new hire in our organization, we're looking at that as succession planning. How can we get that person into our organization, help them from a leadership perspective so they can be one of our leaders in the future? Uh, competition threats, uh, access to capital, where we talked about some of that, uh, keeping up with the changes uh, in, the, in the marketplace, uh, uncertainty of health care, talked about that, and then limited human and financial resources. I will tell you, you're coming out, you're in college and getting ready to go out in the job market at a great time. We've assessed there is going to be a shortage of qualified people. In my job across, I was in a meeting one time and they said, everybody raise their hand that your top two people in your organization are going to be retiring in the next 10 years. 85% of the people's hands went up. So that means that CEO is going, but also the chief operating officer is going, who might have been the normal progression, 85% of the people's hands went up. There's going to be a real void of people, uh, so we believe as an organization we have to grow them. So it is a place. So we've gotten a little bit bigger, but one of the things that we've really found is we can get a little bit bigger, but we still have to be nimble. If we're not willing to make a change and create a national creative solutions in a three-month time period to be out there, we're not going to make it. If you're not willing to make change in a quick fashion, do the analysis and then make a decision and move on, it's going to be very difficult to be successful. Now, I will also tell you that I learn a lot of things from the people I work for, our residents. And um, uh, one of the things I've learned is I need to be flexible. Just because I think that this is the way it's been my whole career. If I'm not willing to be flexible, I'm not going to be successful. So I have learned that, and I'm going to stay as flexible as I can as, uh, as we're moving forward. So how are we going to do some of those things? Well, we're going to identify and evaluate and implement internal and external strategies uh, to support the ongoing mission. I've already talked about our mission reviews. That's a critical piece for us. We're constantly going through that assessment process. Uh, we're also looking at the services that we're doing today. How can we realign those to be more effective? Remember? I'm going to be flexible, so all of our team, when we talk with our team members, we need to be flexible, and then we're also looking at appropriate expansion of services. So the mission review process, uh, it comes in in a couple of ways. Um, some of the pieces, we're looking at the data uh, on the one side, uh, we do that analysis, uh, but that analysis is occurring with team members. This isn't done by some group up in an ivory tower with a coat and a suit on. This is by people that actually know what's going on. We bring the people who actually are in the front lines doing this, we pull, and we pull that, that information together. We look at benchmarks. How can we possibly reach those top benchmarks in everything we're doing? Then at that point, uh, we establish targets. We also do believe that uh, you have to set targets that are measurable. If you go and you set a target that nobody can ever tell whether you've met it, what good is that? It really doesn't do any good for you, for me, or for an organization. <clears throat> the way that I've seen that we've been successful is to have an engaged team. Um, if you get that buy-in at all levels, you're able to achieve a lot. We would have never hit the 10 million if we had not come out and our board been smart enough to say, we're not going to have anybody laid off. I don't believe we could have achieved that because at that point, we had buy-in. People were willing to do things that they would have never done before. We also, uh, we believe in celebrating when people do great things. When we're seeing a financial improvement, let's celebrate. Let's go and recognize that and let's celebrate those things. Uh, we also, uh, we're looking at the various metrics uh, on which uh, progression will be measured, as I talked about. and. Uh, we also, I told you we're doing a lot of IT changes right now. We think that technology is going to be key, whether it's what we're doing or what anything else you're going to be doing, it's going to be a key component for us as we move forward. So we're also looking at this realignment of services and, um, and also with expansion of programs and services. One of the things uh, we're looking at doing is trying to take and leverage our resources. 
Uh, I talked about uh, Ashler Creative Solutions. Uh, there was a place that uh, somebody told me, apparently you weren't doing enough. You must have been sitting twiddling your thumbs, because if you can do this, obviously you weren't busy enough. But in the reality is, we need to go and do stretch goals. And as an organization, sometimes that's leveraging those resources. We also want to adapt to changing uh, customer preference. Right now, uh, we serve people who are over 100 years of age, um, down through uh, individuals who are in their 40s and 50s, uh, who are in our healthcare center. We have a broad spectrum of what people are looking for. If you go and think one thing is going to be the answer in uh, what we do or what any of your other customers that you're going to have in the future, I'm willing to share with you, I don't believe that's accurate. I think you need to focus on what customers want and make sure that you're doing that as you move forward. We're also looking at uh, taking and growing existing services. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I want to make sure, because I think I'm coming up here on a close to my ending. Uh, but a lot of the services we have at all of our campuses, we're constantly looking at how can we possibly uh, grow those services. And sometimes we're also looking at identifying new locations. In this past two years, we've looked at 14 locations throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to acquire. Uh, we've looked at those and they had to hit two things and they needed to be in an area that would serve our mission and they needed bottom line They needed to help our mission. So in doing that uh, we're uh, We've made an offer on one and a for-profit company came in and offered a higher amount Again, they weren't focused specifically on a mission as we were uh, So that was something that we recognized that was not the right opportunity, but we'll have some of those in the future uh, Ashler Creative Solutions, I've talked quite a bit about that. It is a subsidiary of our organization. It's leveraging the Masonic Village team, and it's there to support the mission of the Masonic Village as well as the mission of other organizations that we're working with. In New Jersey, on April 1st, we took over uh, managing a community uh, in Burlington, New Jersey. And uh, with that, um, what is it that uh, they had an occupancy problem? Uh, this was one of their, um, their units that they had. Um, their occupancy fell to 35%. For those business managers, uh, business majors, that doesn't work, if you're, if you're wondering about that. Uh, they came to us and said, hey, what can we do? They had had an offer from their current management company, what they should recommend doing, and they weren't sure if that was the right answer. We gave a recommendation then based upon we've done a, two other of our locations that has been highly successful. So we took that and we made it into this. So would you be interested in this? Or is this more attractive? So we went from 35% to 100% reserved in three months. We started the construction. And in August and September of this year, uh, we moved in the first phase residents. And in January of next year, we'll finish the second phase for 85 apartments. This is an example of another existing and the opportunity that we wound up with the design uh, to provide something different. Sometimes it's just having the right item that you're ready to try to market or you're trying to share. And how do you do that? From my perspective, you need to listen to your customers. Coming out of 2008 and 2009, we slowed down here in Elizabethtown, but we knew that there were people who were anxious to become part of our community. So we put together a plan to build 100 new cottages on our campus. And we weren't going to do it until we got through the economic challenges that we saw those. So as soon as we did, uh, we came out with that. And we have now built 100, 100% 100 of them reserved and occupied. So within less than a three year time period, uh, we did that because we were listening to customers who were on our priority and waiting list. What did they want? But I have to tell you, halfway through this project, we had a person come to us and said, I don't, I'd like to change the design of the roof structure in one of the apartments. They were willing to pay for the engineering and for the cost. A lot of organizations would have said, well, we'll let you change the carpet, but we're not going to change the structural integrity of the roof. But we did. They were thrilled after we saw it, we changed the design for the balance of our cottages that we built on that project. It's another example of listening to what customers have to say because many times they're going to have a better idea than possibly you as a leader might have. This is our community in Lafayette Hill 
And uh, that was a community joined us in 2004. Um, they were losing approximately $3 million a year in on operations. Um, we did some major remodeling for them internally at that point. Now we came through the 2008, 9, and 10 time period, and we were doing, been doing some marketing. So we came out and we looked and we said, we think that we need to be putting an addition on based upon what uh, we were hearing from potential customers. So right now, uh, construction is underway uh, for us to be building a new addition that's the blue that's, uh, that's uh, on this diagram, 60 new apartments that will be joining us. We've been running 100% occupied in our retirement living there for over a year. We're adding this uh, in. Uh, the other piece that we're doing, it used to have an entrance right on Ridge Pike. No stop, no red lights, very dangerous. We now tied this in. They're coming over on the right-hand side as you're looking at that um, so that they can come out at a red light. We're also changing the way it looked. This is a 1970s building. Kind of looks like a 1970s building. So we're also changing the facade so that this is what we anticipate that it's going to look like. We're also down at the bottom is the 60 unit apartment that's going to be adding. That's one of those pieces that we know this is going to be successful. We already have uh, close to 75% of the units uh, reserved for this and this opens up next July of 2015. One of the things that uh, we talked a lot about some of the challenges out there and I'm not quite sure which of our team members we lost in this uh, quicksand, but healthcare reform, reform and the uncertainty of reimbursement is probably tops. And I'm going to uh, jump through some of this. Accountable care, you hear a lot about that um, on TV, in the newspaper, in various cycles. Uh, that's a major portion of change that we're seeing. And one of the things that it's doing is that it's, it's creating partnerships that we never saw before. We're working right now with acute care health systems that we would have never worked before across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The reason is they're going to be getting paid differently. It used to be when I went to the hospital, they got paid. Now, in the future, the way this will probably work is they'll get a bundled payment. They'll get a certain amount for Joe Murphy. Then, if they keep me healthy, they get more money because they didn't have to provide any service to me. But if they provide $50,000 worth of service, and they only got $10,000, they just lost $40,000. So the focus is going to be on how do you provide good quality preventive, preventive care and how can you do it at the best place. We've already established relationships. We're doing transitional care units where people will be able to come to us outside of the hospital. So these are things that we're looking at. We also are working with um, several programs um, on January 1st, we're looking at being in a, bu a bundled program that would enable us to take some risk to do this. We've been doing managed care, uh, providing services for over six years. Our admissions, readmissions to the hospital are some of the best that the hospital has ever seen because we're able to keep people out of the hospital because of high quality care and services. Reimbursement, I already told you that the budget changed and $6 million went out. That type of thing is not going to change going forward in the future. So why do we, why do we wind up doing some of the things that um, we do? Um, I would have to share with you, for me, this is one of those. Uh, these are some of the kids from our children's home. For me, that accountant that joined the organization almost 40 years ago that was focused on a bottom line now recognizes the most important aspect of what we do is our mission. Uh, these are young folks that are coming and they have an opportunity to be extremely successful because they're part of our children's home. They have opportunities to learn. They have opportunities for them to go and have fun. They're looking for their future because it will be bright because of being part of our children's home. They have a chance to go and have great athletic ability um, as a side piece but also to develop friends. I know that in the future, some of these are going to be the future leaders. Some of the people who are in our children's home today, they're going to be some of our leaders. We're also blessed to be able to care for those that have done so much for us up to this time. Uh, we're blessed to take care of some of the greatest uh, individuals um, that I've ever met. We also believe in every person's different, that individuals should have a right to what makes them happy. 
We also believe that it's important to take care of the small things. Maybe it's to check and see, is there a tomato growing on that plant yet today? That might be the most important thing that we do in a certain day. Maybe it's to look at some goldfish to see whether or not, uh, or to have some time for some quality, of some quality time with somebody. Ultimately, though, we're looking for the right people to be part of our community. We're looking for people who have servants' hearts. If you haven't got this yet, this maybe is a, a tad on a recruitment piece that I'm doing for each and every one of you, that if uh, you possibly have found any of this interested, or you possibly would like to know more, uh, we've been blessed as an organization with great people from Elizabethtown College. They've helped us with our mission. They've helped us in our service. We've found people with servants' hearts. And we recognize that we're going to be having some of our leaders who will be coming as E-Town College grads. I'm available for questions if you have some. Yes? You said before um, when you were talking to um, the, what's the name of the company, um, that did the evaluations. Standard and Poor's. Yeah, that's right. Um, have you ever run into any other problems with people who seriously disagree with your mission or didn't understand people that you had to work with that posed a problem that they didn't understand that the mission came first? Yeah, I, I think that um, that is uh, an area that um, I'm fortunate that I'm around a lot of my peers are in other uh, nonprofits. Um, and there are some quality for profit organizations. But some people will consistently focus back on, I want it to be about a bottom line. I recognize what mission is, but mission is fluff. Part of what I'm hoping to tell you today is, I don't believe it is. I think that it's extremely important. It makes some of the quality of life that our country um, is able to experience. I think that this is important. So yes, I have. But fortunately, I'm pretty passionate about mission. And uh, most of those, I've, I felt that I at least came out even with them. Thanks. Yes? You mentioned employees that are very engaged. What is your uh, employee retention like? How do you keep them engaged? Yeah, well, great question. Uh, what is our uh, industry, industry numbers for uh, our industry is a turnover between 30 to 40% a year. Um, our goal has been 15%. We just lowered it to 14%, and that includes retirements. So uh, we are, we're running at about uh, a third of what industry standards are. And uh, I would share with you that there's good news and bad news. The good news is we keep people, we try to hire the best and then keep them. And we stay focused on doing that on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the, the challenge with that is uh, we've now had quite a few people that have worked with us and we recognize over the next 10 years uh, we're going to have people retiring. So it is going to be a place where we're looking to go and restock some of those people that uh, want to be part of this mission going forward. Any other questions? Yes? You said you use uh, very little leverage with your, uh, when it doesn't look like big money projects that you're doing, so how much money did you borrow for those projects and how much is your own? Right now we have uh, about $200 million, that, a little bit over $200 million that we borrowed. Uh, last year, we did a, a borrowing of $38 million for uh, the project at uh, Lafayette Hill, and we're also redoing our health care center. Uh, those two projects uh, combined are $38 million. And to be honest with you, we had planned on doing those with existing dollars. Uh, our investment average is about a 7% return over a 30-year time period on our investments. We were able to borrow at 2.59%. So we borrowed at 2.59, we're earning 7%. Um, all of that was based upon wanting to make sure we could do that to help serve our mission. Great question. Others? Yes? Uh, how has the Affordable Care Act affected your bottom line, so to speak? Have you seen an increase in costs? Well, uh, affordable care, as it's, it's rolling in, um, is still probably a year or two away from being major. Uh, right now, uh, we're working with um, three major health systems to become preferred providers in their, in their systems. Um, we do recognize that when that bundled payment comes down, uh, if you're not 
if you're not doing a good job, uh, there's penalties that come into play with that. So really nobody, nobody in Pennsylvania yet has a good answer to that. We think, however, our outcomes are significant, that we will be a valuable player. So we're hopeful that we're going to be able to at least maintain and possibly slightly improve to again support our mission. But we also recognize that going forward, the dollars are going to be dwindling. So I think that's going to be a continued challenge that's just going to spread uh, outside of the post-acute where we're at into the acute care providers uh, also. Other questions? I'll be here if, uh, afterwards if you'd like to talk to me individually. Thank you very, very much for allowing me to be with you. Have a great day.